Next, I want to talk about slope as a rate of change. So we know that slope is the ratio of the change in y to the change in x. So right there in the words, we see that idea of change right there. Um, and ratio and rate are very similar um, ideas. So a ratio of the change in y to a change in x really correlates to having a rate of change concept here as well. So it can also be interpreted as a rate of change of the dependent variable per unit change in the independent variable. So comparing that y to that x. So let's look at an example here to start. The line graphs for the living arrangements of young adults are shown in the figure below. So this is actually in the beginning of your chapter two, although I didn't bring it in here. Um, find the slope of the line segment for the percentage of young adults ages 25 to 34 owning a home and describe what this slope represents. So I want you to think that when you hear the term rate of change, so those terms slope and rate of change really just mean the same thing. So if you see a question that asks for the rate of change, you're just finding the slope and vice versa. Usually we tend to use rate of change more with applications um, to kind of bring in some meaning there, but it really just means to find the slope. So what we're doing here is we're finding the slope of the line segment percentage of young people ages 25 to 34 owning a home. So I'm looking at this line right here and use the points that are given. So I can clearly see one point here. So that point there is what, um, 2,045. And then right here, this point, I can see lines up with, um, actually they give it to me right here. Oh, I should get, sorry, let me fix this. I should use 45.4 instead. So I'm using that value right there. I, almost drew right through it. I did draw right through it, but I'm using this value here. So 45.4. And then the other value, this point right here is that 217. And I'm gonna be more accurate. I'm gonna use the point given. So 38.4, instead of trying to round to the nearest hole. So definitely use what's given. Uh, make sure you pay attention. I do that too, where you, know, you kind of look at the graph, but if they give you a specific value for a point, definitely use that. Cause they probably want us to use that one decimal place here in our calculation. So I'll use those two points. And now I'm just gonna go ahead and find the slope. So I'm looking at the change in Y's in the top. So it doesn't matter which one I start with. We can start with that um, 38 value maybe. And then I'm looking at the change in Y, X is in the bottom. Now, if I start with the 38, make sure you start with the 2017. So we always start with the same point. And let's see, I get negative seven over 17. Now, normally we do like our answers as fractions, particularly with slope. The exception to this is sometimes in word problems. Now in this case, notice that all my values are giving as decimals here. So even though negative seven over 17 is more accurate, it probably makes sense for us to give this answer in a decimal form, because that's how the data is given to us here. So if I plug this into my calculator, I get that it's about um, negative point four one. Now let's think about what this represents. So the way I often like to do this is I like to think about my variables. So notice here, your M is your change in Y's over your change in X's. Now my Y values here, right, represent the percentage. And it's this case of people who own their home. And then my X values here represent the year. Right, so 2000, 2005, 2010, et cetera, but it represents the year. So it helps you know what your variables represent here because you wanna remember that you're looking at that change in those variables, right? The change in Y over change in X. So we can bring in units here. Now, if you don't have a denominator, you do have a one. So what this is saying is that it's a negative 0.41% for each one year. So our interpretation here, what does the slope represent? 
This means that for each year that goes by, the change in the percentage of people who own their home goes down by 0.41. So the percentage of young people who own uh, their own home is decreasing by 0.41%. And I said decreasing because it's negative, right? That value, or you see that line is going down. So a negative slope, remember, refers to decreasing. So the percentage of young people who own their home is decreasing by 0.41% per year. Okay. Per year means one year. So that word per typically refers to a value of one there in the denominator. So that's just one way that we can write the sentence. Again, there's other ways you could write it too, but that's the overall idea here. So think about your units. This is where it's asking a little bit trickier. What does Y represent? Y represents a percent. What does X represent? It represents a year. So this is the change in the percent compared to the year. So we're changing by 0.41%. Here it's negative, so we're going down for each one year. Now we can take this a little bit further. So we've always been talking about slope in reference to lines, but we can extend this concept to curves. And that's where we get into the idea of average rate of change. So when you see average rate of change, again, I still want you to think about slope, right? Average rate of change relates to slope of the line. So if you're asked that question, just find the slope, okay? Um, and what the average rate of change relates to, it is the slope of the line containing those two points. Um, but we tend to use this term instead when we have a curve, so something that's not a straight line. What we do is we create a line through two points. So let's say we're using this point right here and this point right here on the blue curve. So our blue curve is what we're focusing on. We draw a line in between them and that line is actually called a secant line. A secant line is just any line that touches a curve at two points. And what we do is we find the slope of that line. So you're actually not finding the slope of the curve, technically speaking, you're finding the slope of the line that we create to those, through those two points and that's called the average rate of change, okay? So average rate of change is still a slope. It's just the slope between the line that we create that lies near the curve, okay? So let's do some examples there. So we're gonna find the average rate of change um, for the function here, f of x equals x squared. And this is a U-shaped function. And I have the graphs below here, we'll look at it in a second. But that blue line here is that original function, that blue curve. So that's what we're looking at here. So we want to find the average rate of change. Just think about this as slope. So slope of the, in this case, it's going to be the secant line. So it's not the actual curve, but it's the line that we can draw between the two points. So you're still using that formula y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Okay, that's still what slope represents here, but we're using function notation now. So the way we write it in function notation is f of x2 minus f of x1 over x2 minus x1. Remember that the function notation and y is completely interchangeable. So it's the same exact formula, it's just that we're using function notation instead here. So to find an average rate of change, you need to find those function values or those y values before you start. So I'm gonna do a here. So if I'm looking for f of x1, I'm looking for f of zero. So my x1 value is zero. And what we get here is we just plug it right into our equation. So zero squared equals zero. So I have that f of zero is equal to zero. And if you find it easier, remember you can write this as a point zero, zero. Now for my second one, here I'm using the value one. So I'm just gonna replace one in the formula. So one squared equals one. So F of one is equal to one, but that's the same thing as having the point here, one comma one. So if you don't like the function notation, just change it to points. And now you can just find your slope as usual, okay? So when I subtract 
f of one minus f of zero over one minus zero, right? My f of one value is one. My f of zero value is zero. So I'm subtracting the y values on the top and then I'm subtracting the x values on the bottom. And what I get here is one over one or one. So our average rate of change is equal to one. If you look at the picture here, so that's this graph below. Here's the curve. And here are those two points. There's the point zero, zero I found for you and one, one. And here's the secant line in between it. And what we're saying is that the slope of that line is one. That's the average rate of change. Notice the line is going upward, it's positive. So it makes sense that our answer is also positive, right? One is a positive number. All right, let's do another one. So the first thing you need to do is you need to go ahead and find those y values. So we're gonna find f of x one here, which is f of one. So you're just plugging in one. We already did this one, one squared is one. So you have the first point one, one. And now we're gonna find x two, but our x two value is two. So they're just telling you what your x values are. So we're plugging it in, I get two squared is four. So my second point is two, four. So all we're gonna do is just subtract those y values on top and the x values on bottom. So our y values here are four and one. Our x values are two and one. And what I get is three over one, which is just three. So my average rate of change there is three. If you look at the graph, here's that first point one, one, here's the second point two, four, there's the secant line in between and the slope of that secant line is three. You can see it's much steeper than the first line. So from here to here, you have a faster rate of change, right? You're, that, curve is growing faster than it was from here to here. And then we're gonna do the same thing here. So f of x one, we're just looking at what negative two is. I plug this into the formula, negative two squared is four. So the first point I have is negative two, four. And then we already found f of zero. It's just zero squared is zero. So we have that point zero, zero. It doesn't actually matter which point you start with, um, just like for regular slope, I just kind of tend to go in order. So I'm going to do my y values um, starting with this point, and then my x values will be 0 minus negative 2. So my y value is 0 minus 4, and then I have 0 minus negative 2 in the denominator. This is going to give me a negative 4 over positive 2, which is negative 2. So my average rate of change here is negative two. And if you look at that graph, here is a point negative two, four to zero, zero. And if you draw that secant line right through, you can see that it is going downward. So it does make sense that that slope is negative or that rate of change is negative. So your average rate of change is just the slope. That's all it is, the slope between those two points. You often have to find your y values first. So if you don't like the function notation, just throw it out. Just go ahead, plug in your values, find your two points, and then just find the slope. That's all we're doing here. Um, and that's your average rate of change. So it just shows the rate of change between two specific points on the curve. Now, what we do in pre-calculus and calculus is we take this a little bit further. So instead of picking specific values, sometimes we'll look at our first value being x and our second value being x plus h. So that h value we like to make very small. So theoretically, like let's say your x value was one, then your x plus h value could be like 1.1. So you're looking at the change between two points that are very close together, where here these points are kind of far apart. Um, so this is that, that next piece that you would take in a pre-calculated calculus course. So let's use that average rate of change formula, but with these values instead, these expressions. So that f of x2 minus f of x1 over x2 minus x1. Well, here f of x2 is going to be x plus h. x1 is just x. 
x2 is x plus h and x1 is just x. So we simplify to this formula here. Now notice my x's are gonna cancel and I'm left with just h. This formula here is actually a really important formula in pre-calculus and calculus. It's called the difference quotient. So we're gonna see it a little bit in our class, but if you're continuing on in mathematics, you're gonna be working a lot with it. Um, and the reason it's so important is because what we do in calculus is we make that H smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And that makes those two points on the graph get closer and closer and closer together. So that when you're finding your average rate of change, those two points are very, very, very close together. And eventually we get that H value to go to zero. And when we do that, we're able to find the rate of change at a specific point on a curve, not just at the secant line. Um, and that's really leads us into what's called differentiation in calculus. So it's an interesting concept where, again, we basically are just taking two points that are closer and closer and closer together so that when we find that rate of change, we're getting it down to pretty much finding it at a single point rather than finding it at two points that are far away, uh, which is really helpful to be able to know what, how the graph is changing in a very, very small area. Uh, so that's sort of the calculus piece that we're not going to do so much here, but uh, we'll touch on a little bit in our class and you're going to see a lot more in pre-calculus and calculus. I want to show you a picture of that on the next page, but I just have um, a, just a quick link citation here as well for the image that I did not create it. So again, this is the difference formula. And here what you have, so it looks very similar to our example, but you know, this could be your first point and this could be your second point. So when we say eight, it's just a point that is a little bit further away. So if our X value looks like it's, you know, maybe 1.7 here, then our next value is at 2.7. And then we make it even closer and closer. Maybe our X value is at 1.7 and then our next value is at two, or maybe it's at 1.7 and then it's at 1.8 or it's at 1.7 and then it's at 1.71, right? So we're kind of making that H change smaller and smaller and smaller, which allows us to make these points closer and closer together. And that's where we're going in calculus. All right, so let's do an application with this, that average rate of change. So when a person receives a drug injected into a muscle, the concentration of the drug in the body measured in milligrams per 100 milliliters is a function of time elapsed after injection measured in hours. That's quite a mouthful. So if you look at the graph, you're gonna see your X axis is time in hours. And then your y-axis is the drug concentration in the blood. So initially at that time of injection, again, we're giving it into muscle. So it wouldn't be, it's not shot right into your bloodstream yet, right? It's going into the muscle first. So it's going to take a little bit of time to get fully um, kind of going and working. So you're going to have a peak here of about two hours in, and then gradually that concentration is going to start to decrease over time. Um, and if you think about it too, obviously this is a different kind of drug, but if you just think about if you take some Tylenol or Advil, right, it takes a little bit of time for it to kick in and then eventually you need more because it starts to wear off. So you kind of see that process here. So the figure shows the graph of such a function where X represents hours after injection and F of X is the drug's concentration at time X. We wanna find the average rate of change in the drug's concentration between three and seven hours. So average rate of change, again, just think about slope. So you have those points already there, which is kind of nice. So here's the three and the concentration level is 0.05. And then here's that seven hours and the concentration level is 0.02. Now, the way I copied in the image, I kind of had to copy the answer in as well. So we'll just talk about it rather than me writing it out. Um, but remember for your slope, right? I always, I know your book doesn't really write in that M equals idea. Um, but it really is very, very similar to slope. So remind yourself, how do you find slope? You subtract the Y values on top and the X values on bottom. So notice here, we're subtracting the Y values on top, 0.02 and 0.05, and we're subtracting the X values on bottom, seven and three. When we subtract, we get negative 0.03 over four. And then oftentimes for an average rate of change, we do end up dividing this out, particularly for applications. So we don't like to leave um, decimals and fractions mixed. That's very messy. We usually pick one or the other. Normally for slope, we like fractions. 
but for applications, if they have decimals already, you probably want your answer in the decimal form. So all you do is type this into your calculator and divide and you get this value here. Now, think about what each of these mean, right? So up top here, you have your Y values. The Y value is the drug concentration. The below value is the time, and this is in hours, right? So this would be over one. So this is your change in drug concentration. And this is the change in hours. So the average rate of change is negative 0 0.0075. This means that the drug's concentration is decreasing. And again, it's decreasing because it's negative at an average rate of 0 0.0075. Now the drug concentration was in milligrams per 100 milliliters. So 0 0.0075 milligrams per 100 milliliters per hour. And that per hour is because of this one hour here. So we find the meaning by thinking about what do our variables mean? So the Y idea is on top, the X idea is on bottom. And that denominator piece is gonna typically be one if you're finding that average rate of change, particularly for you know, applications and things. So here it's one hour. So that's why we have the per hour idea. And then your numerator has to do with the units for your Y axis, okay? It's decreasing because it happens to be negative. Now, remember, you're finding the average rate of change between these two points. So you're actually finding the slope of the secant line, right? So the average rate of change is equal to the slope of the secant line. So I know not the curve is not decreasing everywhere, but between those two specific points, we are decreasing overall. So that's why you have a negative slope there. It's not because the entire thing is decreasing, but it's because between those two points, that slope or that change is decreasing. 